A very good afternoon to the SNU family, the extended SNU family. People we hope will join us soon. Um, we welcome you to our uh, fascinating leadership dialogue on the uh, challenges of COVID-19, lessons for leaders of tomorrow. Uh, you know, like Spider-Man said, with great power comes great responsibility. And leaders are more responsible now than ever for helping us survive and conquer the crisis. So today we have amongst us such a leader, Kishore Jairaman, who is the president of Rolls-Royce for India and South Asia. He has guided Rolls-Royce into a new era of digitally leading innovative frameworks and is a big champion for Industry 4.0 and several other things. He's also famous for his ideas on leadership development and strategic ecosystem evolution. It is a privilege to have him join us today. Welcome, sir. We Thank hope you. to learn many things from your wisdom and experience in the discussion. Our Senior okay. Dean of Strategic Initiatives, Dr. Banerjee, who is also the Director of the School of Management and Entrepreneurship, will be seeking perspective from Mr. Jairaman on what leadership and strategy can mean, can evolve into through and beyond the chapter of COVID-19. Over to you, Dr. Banerjee. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, Kishore, if I may call you by the first name. Uh, uh, wonderful to meet you. And really appreciate the fact that uh, uh, you've taken time out to, uh, to be with the forum. You know, this period of the time is very, very critical for the for many young people of this country, or uh, for the world, in fact, where they are making uh, one of the most important decisions of their lives. And that was uh, to go to university, number one, and to go to which university, number two, and da 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 da. So, uh, so and of course, COVID situation of the day uh, has um, uh, sort of uh, complicated the mix. And we deeply appreciate uh, your time that uh, I will spend talking a little bit uh, so that you can put some clarity in this decision making process. Okay, so uh, Rajat has um, introduced um, Kishore, and I'd spend a few more bites to talk a little bit more about uh, what I've learned doing uh, secondhand research on you, uh, Mr. Jairaman, and, uh, uh, and I'll introduce you. Uh, broadly, you know, we have about an hour, and before we go ahead, I'd like to share with everybody that I have kind of a plan to structure this conversation into six parts. Uh, in the initial part, uh, talk a little bit about your personal journey, uh, about your love for aviation and, and uh, how, you, uh, how you navigated that. Uh, then uh, in the second part, want to talk a little bit about your time with GE, which I believe uh, you spent you know, more than a couple of decades, if I'm not uh, mistaken, with GE. And uh, uh, that's a wonderful company to learn from. And uh, if you could talk a little bit about Crotonville and so on, we'll, I'll, I'll come to that. The, the third piece would be to discuss the current COVID challenge, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, special economic package that the Prime Minister um, uh, you know, announced, how, you know, uh, whether that's adequate, what that's going to do to the economy. Um, touch upon a little bit about the fascinating and phenomenal R-square data laboratory that uh, you have been associated with. Uh, and. Uh, get a sense of how the future of work is going to look like uh, going forward. Uh, the fourth part I do want to talk, touch upon a bit about how industry and universities could work together, uh, especially in the context of the future. Um, and I'll uh, touch upon that. And then the fifth piece is what uh, specific lessons that um, uh, you might have for the young aspiring professionals who are about to make a decision about which university to go to, what kind of career cho choices to make, what kind of learning strategy to use, etc. And finally, as Rajat said, I'm sure, uh, you know, through our free link conversation, lots of people have lots of questions for you. And uh, we will try to take some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of those questions right at the end in an open QA. So if that's okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, uh, Mr. Kishore Jayaraman, uh, as Rajat mentioned, is currently officiating as the president of Rolls-Royce for India and uh, South Asia. Uh, and in the past, he's had about 23 years with, uh, as president and CEO for GE Energy uh, in India and South Asia. Uh, Kishore uh, uh, presides over several boards of large uh, 
uh, companies and industry committees and associations and matters of leadership and strategy. A uh, little bit about Rolls Royce, as uh, you know, lo uh, you know, um, a lot of you um, are aware. Some maybe not, but just to uh, give you a brief overview, uh, Rolls Royce is the leading manufacturer service provider of aero engines for large uh, civil aircrafts uh, and corporate jets worldwide. It powers more than 30 types of commercial aircrafts operated by airlines, freight operators, lessers, and corporations. Uh, Rolls-Royce uh, engines, um, uh, you know, of several types are powering several military aircrafts, uh, including the Indian Armed Forces. Uh, and uh, Rolls-Royce also happens to be the leading provider of high and medium speed reciprocating engines, complete propulsion and drive systems, distributed energy solutions and fuel injection systems. And, uh, and, la and last but not the least, are probably one of the chief innovators on, uh, on, on how uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, machine learning is is architecting uh, really a new way in which human beings are going to live their lives going forward. Uh, so, uh, with that as a brief, uh, Kishore, uh, as I said in the uh, in the beginning, um, let's talk a little bit about your personal journey. What drew you to um, to the spaces, uh, to engineering? Take us through a little bit of your uh, early life. Well, thank you very much, Professor Banerjee. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And, um, you know, one thing is certain, change is inevitable. I had prepared a big speech and said, here are the points I'm going to discuss. And out of that, out of your six points, I think one of them matches. So, but, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to just wing this. And I think uh, that's the best way to do it is, you know, I just uh, talked to you about uh, some of the questions that uh, you guys wanted me to sort of talk about and then uh, take it from there. So the first one, personal journey. Again, uh, we talk about change, right? And um, the, originally, I did not want to be an engineer. I just wanted to be a pilot. And I wanted to be a commercial pilot because one of my friend's father was a commercial pilot and I saw them flying around in Indian Airlines when I was growing up. And, um, you know, it was like a dream. I mean, you could fly up there. It was like a dream. And I said, yeah, I want to be a pilot. But then I looked at NDA and I said, maybe I should join in the Defense Forces, the Air Force, and uh, become a pilot there. So when I had this conversation with my father, he said, you need to understand that there are only 13 aircrafts in Indian Airlines today. And one of the pilots of those is, a, is the son of the Prime Minister of India. And so the odds of you becoming a pilot with Indian Airlines seem to be against you. So I would suggest that you take some other field to study for the moment and then figure out what you want to do in the future. Then I said, let me go to NDA. So I tried uh, the NCC, but somehow, you know, my heart was not in it and I kind of gave up. I didn't want to go through the whole thing because again, the risk of uh, probably not being a pilot and ending up being a maintenance crew was very high. And so there goes my ambitions of aviation and uh, there goes my ambitions of piloting. But uh, the thing was, I come from a family where my father is an engineer, all my cousins are engineers, was an engineer. So I think there's been tons of engineers in the family. And so it was but natural that I went and studied engineering. So I have, uh, I did my mechanical engineering. And um, as the times would be, it was, was about 1980s, mid 1980s, late 1980s. So it was all about just going to the U.S. and uh, doing your master's and then building your career in the U.S. That was what the whole game was about in those days. And so I did the usual routes, you know, did my MS in mechanical engineering and then joined GE. And in GE, I joined into heat transfer and uh, in a, you know, in a hot strip. So it's as far as you can get away from uh, aviation at that point in time. And I was uh, pretty much kind of, you know, at that point, change was inevitable. And so I had to figure out, so what is it I liked with mechanical engineering? I really liked solving problems and I really liked to go and find a solution. And so, you know, I was in real time process control. So on an everyday basis, you look at the feedbacks, you look at the loops, you kind of correct it. So that's what it was all about. And um, so, you know, I kind of enjoyed it. I grew in that and I became a systems engineer. I became a process control expert in that area. For six years, I did this with multiple steel mills around the world with GE. And then, you know, it was just the progression from technology. What is it I wanted to do? And I tried project management and it was a commercial side. 
And then the commercial was just uh, brilliant. <clears throat> I just loved the commercial side of things. And so that was, again, look, the change happened from wanting to be a pilot to becoming a mechanical engineer, to being in India, to going over to the U.S., to in the U.S. doing something in terms of hot strip mills, and then from hot strip mills just going over into uh, material handling as a project manager, and then commercial, moving from technology to commercial. So it was like continuous, you know, sort of evolution and a change. And I think the underlying theme there has always been that the challenge of learning, the challenge of solving something, the challenge of, uh, you know, kind of breaking the odds was always with me. And I think then I became into commercial, commercial director. Then it didn't become business. So you started going from a business into a domain, which was commercial. And in that domain, you do multiple things. You are able to go and uh, talk to talk to customers. You are able to negotiate contracts. You're able to administer contracts. You're able to, you know, do a lot of things through that. And it was also technology because commercial and technology were very closely interwoven. And so then I did all these and I moved into energy business. And so again, in the commercial role. And then I came to India after five years of doing that globally in the oil and gas sector, in the gas turbine world, steam turbine world. And then finally came into India and it was even bigger experience I had. Number one, I had to understand the market. I needed to create a strategy for the market. Then I needed to make sure that I grew the business. And we had 15 business lines. We had uh, anything you can think of in GE in terms of energy, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be water, whether it be gas turbines, steam turbines, gasification, you know, transmission, distribution, services, you know, nuclear, uh, wind, solar. We had all the portfolios. So it was a tremendous amount of knowledge in terms of breadth. But it was also a tremendous amount of hard work because every realm had customers who had their own niche interests. And it was about making sure I figured that out. So that has been the other side of things when I came to India. And then after about 23 years, I was to go back from India. But then uh, as life would be, sometimes I think it's destiny. Sometimes I think it is uh, the need to learn. Sometimes I think it is just an opportunity too hard to give up. And it brought me back to my childhood dreams of being a pilot. And the closest thing I could do was work for a company that built the engines that the pilot have to rely on, that the pilots have to completely rely on. And so, you know, being in gas turbines, it was very easy for me to understand the technology side of the, uh, of the aviation, the aircraft engines. And so it was just a question of understanding business models, understanding the sector, understanding the needs of customers. So there I was able to bridge a technology and a commercial space and kind of, you know, the life goes around a full circle. So for me, that is what brought me around into the aerospace sector. And I'm enjoying it thoroughly. For the last eight years, we've worked very hard. We have three businesses, civil aerospace, different and uh, power systems. And the power systems is on the energy side still. And uh, defense is a BD new space I had, but it has been a very interesting learning there. And then uh, civil aerospace, but of course, um, you know, it is something I just love it. Every time I sit in the aircraft, I look to see. I already know these days, I know when I get into an aircraft, uh, especially on international flights, whether it's not a Rolls Royce engine or a GE engine or a Pratt and Whitney engine. But I think um, it used to be a time where I used to look outside the window and make sure that I'm looking at the engine and whose engine I'm flying on. But it's, it's a pride. It's, a, it's just a, really a joy. It's the highest uh, end of technology. It is uh, fascinating as to how much of uh, thrust is required, how much of horsepower is required, and how much of sophistication is required, and then understanding the whole way the supply chain works, the whole way the customers work, because it's a, it's a completely different field than energy sector. And so it's been a fantastic learning, and I think, uh, you know, I would never, uh, I would never want my life to be any different than what I have had over the last 30 years. It's been a blessing. Um, but having said that, I think now GE, I, you know, like uh, Professor Banerjee said, it has been a really uh, fantastic, uh, you know, learning curve for me. It was a great company, lots of good leadership learnings. I have been to Crotonville almost every year in my 23-year career. Uh, initially, it used to be for uh, coursework, and then it used to be as, as you advance, you go into more and more advanced courses. There was only one program I had not attended in Crotonville, and I had been to every other program in Crotonville for leadership. And, um, you know, and then the leadership becomes one of interaction with senior leaders like Jeff Imelt, you know, and board members and other things. So in principle, it was a wealth of uh, knowledge that GE created and uh, really kept me on my toes 
and made me who I am today. So I'm forever grateful to GE. And then you come into Rolls Royce and you learn, uh, you know, new ways, new management styles. So, you know, it was a US company, GE, and Rolls Royce is a British company. And so you do have cultural differences. You do have people who basically, um, you know, do things differently and who think differently and who operate differently and uh, governments are very different. So I think there was a lot of this learning that went on in terms of cultural sensitivities, in terms of, to be very honest with you, I had to learn English again because the American is not English and, uh, and the Indian is definitely not English. So, you know, it was kind of a very interesting uh, phase of trying to figure out what the British said at one point in time and uh, then trying to work my way from there. So look, at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, I've been very privileged in life to work for two great companies, uh, GE and Rolls-Royce. And I have 30 years, I've completed 30 years of working life. And I think um, as we go forward, you know, I, I look forward to not only leveraging the experience that I have, but to probably share that uh, with, uh, with the universities, with consulting, with advisors, and so sort of, build into the next phase of life. So that is what I'm thinking of in terms of my personal life and career and goals and aspirations. And, and then when I come down to reality, then you come back to reality and you say, where are we today? You know, it's unprecedented times, as we all know. I don't think uh, if, we, if we, all of us rebound and reflected back and say that, uh, did we ever think that a world would shut down, uh, you know, as of March 22nd? I think even March 22nd, before India asked for the voluntary shutdown on the Sunday, I don't think anybody even thought about a lockdown. Anybody even thought about, you know, how big this crisis is. And then on Monday, all of a sudden, one fine morning, everything is stopped. You can't go out. You go out. There's a lot of uh, challenges with, uh, you know, it was a curfew. And then you started reading the news and you start looking around you and you see that this is kind of a really crisis of, uh, of uh, proportions never seen before. And it, it takes time to settle in, it takes time to understand, uh, you know, and, uh, and reality strikes. So for us, you know, we are all used to having 500 people in Bangalore working in the engineering center, and we had export controls, rules and regulations. We had IT, which had really video screens with a server located somewhere in the world. And then you have to, all of a sudden, all these people become unproductive. And uh, yes, definitely the option is not to say, let's stop work. The option is to figure out what do we do next? And so we went about doing it, right? So now all our employees, so we have 500 in Bangalore, we have about 350 in Pune, and all of them started working from home. We had to figure out IT solutions. We had to figure out uh, a lot of things, export controls. The governments were very good about it because they all helped us to achieve those export control rules uh, and regulations that were modified for these times, work from home times. And, uh, you know, so for our productivity went back up to 100%. What we could not do is go meet the customer. What we could not do is travel from place to place to meet people. But then, look, I was never an expert in Zoom. I was never an expert in Microsoft Meeting. I was never an expert in GoTo. I, was, I didn't know about Google Hangouts, right? So now I'm an expert in all the stuff, right? I'm an expert because I can even adjust my background. I can put a golden gate screen on my background if I wanted to, right? So that you guys will be, you know, all thrilled to not see my uh, living room background. But that's what, you know, it has been change change and evolution has been a constant. I know. And I think uh, that is where we are. But then if you look at the, the stimulus packages, you look at the situation, because it is so complex, because nobody has a clue how to handle these things, I think the best decision India did was to go into the lockdown. You know, it was a pause. It was a pause that basically gave time for people to think. And, you know, anybody who says that we shouldn't have gone into lockdown would never be able to come up with a better answer because the better answer has an uncertainty that they cannot answer. They will immediately say that, oh, we won't have so many cases still, but then nobody knew that. So I think it's a fantastic thing. We delayed it. So the outcome of this is we delayed the onset. If at all there is to be an offset, onset, we have delayed the onset. And by delaying the onset, what we have done is we have made enough preparations, learning from what the world has done, so that we're able to handle the crisis. Right? So it has got to be extremely, you know, the, the whole thing is we, didn't, we reacted, but we also responded. Right? And the response is in terms of building the infrastructure to make sure when the onset happens, if it happens, we are able to handle it. 
But in the meantime, take the time, take a breather, and basically get ourselves in shape. And then that leads us to the latest uh, financial packages uh, that the government has announced. Um, look, there's always, a, like everything else, you know, it, you know, and uh, comparing this to the aviation sector or aerospace, it is always easy to take off. So the aircraft taking off is actually easier. All you need is excessive amounts of thrust, and it just, the wings just uh, create the airflow, and the plane just takes off. The difficulty is in the landing, right? Because you've got to manage a lot of parameters, speed, the uh, wind speed outside, the turbulence outside, a lot of things that have to be managed in the landing. Similarly, lockdown is very easy, but coming out of the lockdown is the hardest part because now you have to manage it so that all 55 days don't go a waste. If you don't do this right, it'll all go a waste and they aren't, you know, it'll just explode and then what happens? So we are all watching carefully. The number of cases, if you see, has been really steady. Yes, there is still an increase, but if you look at it, you know, 1,000 cases in 1.4 billion people or 100,000 deaths per day is still a very small number. But the good thing, and touch wood, and I wish God, I feel, I feel really sad for the people who didn't make it, and the 1,500 mortalities that we have had so far, I feel very sad for them. But then if you take 1.4 billion and you take the reason and other causes of death that happen to us on an everyday basis, the containment that we have had for COVID-19 has been superb. And I think, uh, you know, I think there is a lot of praise that needs to go around. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done with the migrant labor, bringing the economy back, you know, and the economy, in my view, there are two things to the economy. I think one is we have to look at the economy as a pure economy from a mathematical, economical point of view. And you got to look at the economy as a psychological point of view. And the economy, you know, purely, typically is driven by four pillars, which is consumption, exports, private spending, and government spending. And in India, it is always the consumption piece of the economy was really big, right? People understood what it meant uh, to have luxuries in life. And people who are very knowledgeable with television, with media, everything, they were all knowledgeable about all the things they can acquire. Even in the remotest part of India, people knew that they can reach out to Amazon, Amazon would deliver to them. And they could buy whatever they wanted from Amazon. So it's kind of a, you know, there are there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of communication that has happened to people. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, what should I say, um, knowledge or understanding of the, of the material things in life that has happened. And so I think there's a psychological side where the need of human beings has increased a lot. So from an economy point of view, for it to come back, you need to have the labor force. You need to have the working capital. You need to have the investments to be done for companies to sustain long term. You need to look at the more MSMEs. You need to look at the large corporations. You need to look at the uh, you know unregulated or you know non-regulated labor force. You need you need to look at a lot of factors. And I think if you put all these factors in, you know I go back to my original thing in my life: that the control systems. You have to look at all the variables. If you look at too many variables, then you will not be able to control anything because your equation to solve becomes really complex. So we had to take one variable at a time and start eliminating one of those variables. So the first variable eliminated is the working capital needs of MSMEs, yeah. right? And then you've got to give working capital so, they, so the businesses start opening. And then the businesses open, you've got to figure out where the people are going to come from. So the migrant labor has to come from. Then you've got to figure out how the people are going to commute to work. And so you figure out what your metro is going to look like, what your cities are going to look like. How are you going to manage all this? Then you've got to constantly, all these things have to happen under the umbrella of COVID. So you're really looking at, you know, many variables, but distilling it to the primary variables and then to using the primary variables in order to control the outcomes over the short term. And I think that's what we are seeing as we see it today. But the good thing is that you would have noticed, I think all of us uh, in Delhi or Gurgaon or Noida, you see that as soon as they opened it up, there's traffic jams. Bangalore, when they open it up, there's traffic jams. Yeah. Because people are wanting to go out. Yeah. When they go out, there is a natural tendency to buy something, whether it be a food item, whether it be a you know, non-essential item uh, or essential item. So people will consume and people, the consumption will start picking up. When consumption picks up, there's going to be a demand. When demand picks up, all it is is a question of the supply. So the economy will come back. Now the question is, at what pace? We all would like it to go back to the original economy tomorrow. But I think that's not going to happen. 
it's going to take some time and different sectors are going to open up differently so you're going to have you know probably the aviation sector might be the last one to open because nobody wants to have travel and aircraft at this point in time without knowing fully well what is happening with the whole pandemic so yeah tourism is going to be different hotels are going to be different so i think you know there's a lot there's a lot that is going on and uh, i think people have to be calm i think people have to understand that they need to appreciate the complexity of these things and i think media explaining to people about the complexity of these things is going to be the key for what the next steps are going to be but i'm very bullish saying that so give it about 6 months i think everything will come back to normal because then we will have a vaccine hopefully by that time there's already been about some form of cures there is no full cure because it's a virus but then we don't have a cure for cold we don't have a cure for you know many other viral infections so this will be another one of those viral infections as long as the mortalities are controlled then i think this will be a thing of the past and then you'll get a vaccine and then this becomes over but the hopefully the long term we got to think about and that's the companies that are looking at how to make themselves resilient today are the companies that will be able to sustain but what they also need to sustain is create competitive edges because the world is going to be very different even though people will consume they will consume different they are not going to consume the same way if restaurants are making the same things like they did before there's a possibility that people are not going to want to eat the same thing because for 60 days they figured out that they can live without eating out you know so there's got to be a constant you know connect with the market and the consumer is going to be even more aggressive about what they want and when they want and where they want and they're going to be even more reticent about buying because they're going to be worried about the savings they're going to be worried about jobs so there is going to be again this is a really 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 complex phenomenon that that but the beauty of all this things, right the beauty of this thing is look it's a fantastic crisis it's a great crisis there's so many learnings it's once in a hundred years that these kinds of things happen and i think people who learn through this crisis and people who are able to figure out things for themselves and for the general good will be better people the companies will be better companies and i think tomorrow can be better so their focus has to be on the future and the focus has to be on the present the present is to sustain oneself and the future is what is going to eventually take them to where they need to be and i think it's very key to be very closely connected with customers and it's going to be very clear key to understand the dynamics that's going to happen in the market and i think that is what is going to drive the businesses into the future now there's a couple of things that are going to evolve and it's beautiful because i mean as the professor said about r square data labs um you know it's almost a it is almost a given it was almost a given so for us as a company then we looked at what is our future going to look like we bet on two things one is digital the other one is electrification we figured fossil fuels will be a thing of the past yes but gradually and it is extremely important to be carbon sensitive and i think aviation that the pace at which aircraft are being built the pace at which people are moving about was tons of carbon emitted and so to, for us it was you know very imperative that we created the efficiency so biofuels you know hybrid uh, propulsion these were all things that were very important and we started focusing hybrid is nothing but electric so you combine electric with fossils and you basically get a, you know the as the fuel sources and you basically have uh, better emissions you know and you are lowering the emissions that you put out into the atmosphere so i think uh, that will continue i think the world is going to be really looking hard at you know sustainability and i think the you know even though fossil fuels are really cheap today and that will continue for some time i think through our lifetimes we'll see fossil fuel in some form or the other but then renewables will pick up as it has already picked up solar has picked up in the energy sector and i think it will continue to see all this so when in our power systems business we are going to be focused on microgrid and the microgrid is nothing but if you take a data center you will have the grid power which will probably be powered by coal or gas and you will have solar or some form of renewable that power will come in and then you will have battery or you will have some form of a you know third solution that will come in play and basically the whole microgrid concept is how do you leverage from a sustainability point of view from a cost point of view the best fuel option in order to power that particular space at that particular time and this control system what it does is gives the best efficiency 
with the best sustainability option at that point in time, and that is going to be the future for building. So a microgrid could be a ship. A ship has about 4,000 people. A cruise ship has about 4,000 people. And so that's a microgrid by itself. A data center, that's a microgrid by itself. So there are many areas where you can create this microgrid opportunity. We have backup reciprocating engines that will also have a play in this whole thing. Data centers want 24 by 7 uninterrupted milliseconds of power loss is all they can sustain. So battery solutions become very important for them. So I think it's a it's a evolving space and we are going to be participating in that space. Hybrid aircraft. We are looking at a fully electric aircraft. We are looking at vertical takeoff and landing options. So I think all these are in play as we speak today. But during this process, we created the R Square Data Lab because we said data is the key. Right? And uh, you have heard the phrase, data is the new oil. And, um, and in any case, the difference between data and oil is, oil is finite and data is We only finite. hope that this so, oil is clean oil. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, that too, that too, right? And, um, and so when you have, um, you know, so we said, we need to look at it as three pillars. We need to look at digital twins. We need to create opportunities so that we can design the engine sitting in our office space than having to create prototypes every time, which is very expensive and failing through prototypes. So the digital twins was an option we needed to. We needed to be more intelligent about data. We needed to leverage the data better. We need to have the right data set. And we needed to do the right things in order to make sure that we are using the data clearly. But all this will not happen unless all our employees, we have 55,000 employees globally, unless all our employees think digital first. So I think it is extremely important for us as a company that people think digital first, which means that you don't immediately print out something in a piece of paper. Can we yeah. do this digitally without having to print a piece of paper? Right? Can we do this? So we, you know, in our office, all the bank accounts, everything is all done digitally. You know, when I came in eight years back, we used to write checks for every single thing. Today we write zero checks. Yeah. Right? Everything is online. Right? And even in our personal world, I think everything is online. We are in the cloud space. We are uh, ordering through online for e-commerce. So I think digital data, all this are with us today. And I think with COVID, it has proven that this is going to take a bigger form because as COVID has taken over, more and more people working from home means more and more connectivity requirements, which means that the speeds of the uh, internet have to be really up there. And uh, you know, to be very honest with you, I've been very, very surprised at how the telecom and how the data, et cetera, has been working during this crisis. And I you know hats off to those people because we all recognize the medical doctors, the, uh, the policemen, but we don't recognize the telecom operators because that's what has kept people who have been working, you know, working. And I think they've done a super job. They've done a really super job because uh, to be honest, I think, uh, you know, we would be having this call if we didn't have the data connectivity. Yes, it might fail, yes, it might drop, but it's still, it's a fantastic job given the fact so many people are staying at home and connecting. And so, so I think I think digital is going to be the way forward, but along with digital comes uh, you know, challenges with it. And the challenges are going to be cybersecurity, the challenges are going to be speed, the challenges are going to be storage. So the challenges are going to be with energy, so that uh, power consumption. So there's going to be a lot of other challenges that will come up. And I think, uh, but digital is here to stay. I think data is here to stay. I think R Square Data Labs for us is a beautiful start. And I think it will only take us further and further into it. I'm sorry if I've taken too much of time, but five more minutes, Professor, if I'm given that, then I'll, I'll open it up for Q&A. It is, it, it, it is your forum, so all yours, Kishore. Okay. So um, in terms of leadership, look, I talked a lot about change. And I think, um, you know, change is the need of the hour, and it's been the need of the hour through our lives. And it's been the need of the hour for me every day uh, for the last 55 years, right? But along with change, I think what we need to think about is creativity. You know, we have this, the environment has changed already. You know, and the environment keeps changing. Businesses were, you know, in the business line, if you take from the early 1900s, businesses would be there for 50 years, 60 years, and they'd still be okay with the same product line and services. But today, a business life is only 15 years. And the innovation that is required to evolve, Jason, to move into the next spaces is, is at a pace never seen before. And now what has happened as we go more and more digital, as we get more and more, you know, as there is more and more connectivity, there is going to be a need to be creative in everything we do. 
and creativity is not just magic there is a art and a science to it and the science piece is understanding the ecosystem understanding the stakeholders understanding everything around you and the art piece is coming up with the ideas that will be more attractive with the understanding that you have created with the science and i think these two are going to be existent together and i think more and more you're going to see artificial intelligence machine learning all these tools helping people to manage that creativity piece through external stimuli and not just relying on human intelligence so the final decision making will be based on human intelligence and it will be based on experience and expertise so i think the change is there i think creativity is absolutely necessary but i also think it is very imperative that there is courage right if people don't show courage to do things i don't think uh, we will be able to sustain over the next 50 years people who are starting i think on the people who are on the call have a career that's going to span next 50 years and for those 50 years i think it is it requires a lot of courage it requires a lot of you know hard work dedication passion and i think those are words they become words when they are not practiced and to me leadership is about picking a word and then reflecting with that word of what we do with that i know the most powerful thing i have learned is self reflection and i think in leadership you need to ask yourself the question and you need to ask yourself the question with your ecosystem whether what you are doing or what you are saying or what you are you know whatever it is that's an action there is a feedback loop created and that feedback loop should constantly be monitored and those feedback variables the parameters should be adjusted to get the best output and that to me is one of the most critical things of leadership is feedback and acting on the feedback now yesterday i was just uh, flipping through youtube and i ran across a few speeches and uh, it was not intentional but it just happened to be that i was just flipping and just showed up and i like denzel washington i really think he's a great actor right and i think a lot of his movies are really good and i you know it's it's a uh, it's we you know there are a lot of there's all this action movies but there's also this movies that make you think that he acts on and he gave a speech about you know i think he got some award and he was giving a speech and out of the speech i picked one thing and he talked about what it was about to be um, a colored man sort of uh, coming into hollywood and growing in hollywood and becoming who he was and uh, the last thing he said was ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship and we'll come back to it but i think it is very very critical that we understand nothing happens easy in order for anything to happen there's got to be a lot of hard work there's got to be a lot of dedication and then he also said something other and one other thing which i thought was very interesting he said you need commitment if you want to start something you need commitment but commitment does not let you finish something and to finish something you need to have consistency you know and i i i just picked on this and i said that look this is fantastic because it is very appropriate it is very appropriate and immediately when you pick these things it's very nice you can just listen to it and say ah oh, great now i'm going to be committed yeah i'm going to be consistent right but it doesn't work that way <coughs> then you ask yourself the question then you go back and ask yourself the question have i been committed am i committed to something what am i committed to right and in order to be committed how do i take it to where i want to be and that's why it's very important to have a vision very important to have a goal people think companies have to have vision companies have to have goals but i think individuals have to have vision individuals have to have goals right and sometimes your goals might not be you want to achieve the goals which is fine which is fine but if you never had a goal for sure you want to achieve it right having a goal gives you a 50% chance of achieving it and i think it is extremely important that we set our goals early in life and work very very hard towards it and i think that is going to be that is going to be uh, absolutely the key to be successful in leadership and then i always ask myself the question why is it i am not a bill gates why is it i am not a you know steve jobs or why is it i am not a narendra modi you know why is it i am not that right there are people who take risks there are people who do step changes and everybody is different 
and everybody sets their vision, everybody sets their goal, and everybody has their ways of achieving those goals. But none of them ever achieved it without hard work, and none of them ever achieved it without incrementally progressing. A step change might happen at one or two points in life, but incremental is how life actually works. And incremental means every single step of the way, you reset and you got to start again, work as hard you, as you work to get to that reset point. And uh, that's been, you know, when I thought about this and I said, you know, let me, let me see if that is true with me. And uh, to be very honest with you, it is absolutely true with me. There was a point every time that I had to say that, look, I got to do something different. I got to, I'll become stale if I do this. I become very complacent. I become very, I start cruising. And to overcome all this, I have to keep doing this reset and start working at it again. And as long as you have a goal saying that they got to have a goal, everybody has to have a goal and say, this is where I want to be in 30 years. And then distill it down to say, this is what I have to do to reach that in 30 years. And then start working towards it. I'll stop there. Once again, I say ease is a greater set, threat to progress than hard work. Well, thanks, Kishore. I think, uh, I think we, um, you know, thanks to technology and, of course, your, uh, your consistency. Uh, we have covered a, a lot of ground, which uh, probably would have, uh, you know, like, uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad that I gave you the canvas and, and you covered everything. But you have left me at a very good segue. Uh, and I cannot agree with uh, you or Denzel. Uh, that ease is greater than a threat to progress than hardship. And, and many, many times being an academic, um, I keep, uh, at some of my students, I must admit, have asked me this before. Uh, but I keep asking myself, you know, being an academic, that what is the job of a university? Uh, you know, what, what, why, why do people go to university? And people say, oh, I, you need a degree. Uh, you, need to, you need that. You need, you, know, you need to acquire knowledge, etc. However, one of the best sort of, uh, uh, I, I cannot exactly remember, it may have been the Dean of Wharton uh, once said that you see the job of the university is to challenge its people. It, it needs to challenge its people, but when they are challenged and, challenged and they are having a hard time to land, as you said, uh, it is not the job to leave them alone, but give them some guided sort of a, of a runway to land. So, so I cannot agree with that statement that you uh, made the most. And I think uh, uh, in the context of today's um, uh, situation, I think you have given me the perfect segue to ask you a question that you could probably spend some time uh, discussing. That how does 21st century university look like in the sense that, you know, um, I have traditionally lamented uh, in India uh, the role of universities having been very tactical with the industry, as in it's sort of like a, a source for good talent um, that, you know, they would be hardworking. They would have uh, outrun two million people in a race to uh, great, uh, get great grades in joint entrance or CAT and things like that. Uh, but I believe that, you know, um, a, a university uh, and especially in today's context, when you're talking about, you know, you have talked talked about the deep reset that COVID has thrown at the at civilization. That probably there is an opportunity for industry and university to really forge some very specific strategic ties uh, in trying to uh, you know look at bigger problems. You talked about the psychology. You I mean I, I thought it was one of the takeaway that I got from your statement that you know the reset is of course going to be. In, in, in the quantum metrics, economic time, econometric times, by way of what happens to GDP, et cetera. But, but a large part of it could be the psychological reset of, of its citizens. Uh, and therefore, um, I think, uh, do you think that, uh, you know, uh, there is an opportunity for uh, companies like Rolls-Royce or others to come together with the top universities to, uh, to take a stab at bigger problems more holistically? Uh, and the reason I'm asking you this, Kishore, is because SNU, uh, you know, um, uh, happens to be one of the uh, universities of eminence announced by the government of India. We also are the first university who got the Atal Incubation Center nomination, which is um, uh, approved by the Niti Aayog, uh, trying to like uh, really crack open uh, or, or, or give the ecosystem to the uh, young startups to try and solve for 
uh, some of these problems, both at a holistic as well as a technological level. And thirdly, we are looking at ourselves as an interdisciplinary university, uh, wherein we have an uh, engineering school, we have a school of natural sciences, we have schools of social and uh, social sciences and humanities. And of course, we have the school of management, uh, which a lot of us see as the glue or the hub around which a lot of the science and art uh, and, of course, uh, the social sciences wheel around. So what's your view on uh, potentially, uh, you know, a, a progressive universities to work much more closely with the uh, industry in the post-COVID world? All right, uh, good questions. Um, good questions and good thoughts, uh, Dr. Manji. You see, I always try to see, you know, uh, what is it that uh, is a very good thinking in terms of uh, what is it a university is supposed to do with, uh, uh, with students. And um, that thought, you know, I kind of mulled over it for a long time because of my kids, mostly. Right? I mean, it's like when you're in school, you kind of, you're learning. And every single day is learning, right? And it's about knowledge accumulation. And there is a point in time where if one goes through kindergarten all the way into high school, into college, into a graduate program, into a PhD, and then a postdoc. So people who go in that area, they're basically just constantly learning, 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 up until the point of PhD, when they start sort of giving a little bit, but taking more. And then around postdoc, they're giving, giving, giving. And then the life starts, and that's, if you're not doing a PhD or a postdoc, you're in principle going into the industry where you're giving and taking, and you're learning at the same time, but you're giving and taking. So you get to a point at a certain point where you're giving and taking, but at a certain point you're taking more than you're giving. And I think that taking phase, what is happening is as, you know, when I was growing up, it was about competition all the time because you were measured on how many marks you got to get into any, any college. And then you had the social pressure of saying you got to either be an engineer or a doctor to be anybody. Right. And even accounting was not considered charter accountancy, corporate uh, company secretaryship. They were not considered to be fields at all. And so over a period of 50 years, if you look at India as well, you will see that a mindset that went from engineers to doctors has evolved into having chartered accountants and company secretaries and, and then slowly moving to today, psychologists, you know, and people in social sciences, they are all admired as well. Those are seen as potential good job of the general gatherer. But the future of education is going to be more and more of applied sciences than just rote learning. And um, this has been the case with the Western world for quite some time. That's why you, you see in India, a lot of students say that oh, I want to go to the US, I want to go to UK or Australia to learn because there the involvement of academia with industry is very high. Rolls-Royce partners, partners with 37 universities globally. Out of the 37, lots of them are in the UK, of course, because it's our home. And then we have Germany, and then we have the, the, the US. But in all these areas, how it works is there is either a grant or there is a, there is a, there is a government initiative that is given. And then the students are pulled into that initiative and the corporate is pulled into it by saying, you know, by doing this, how are you going to apply this, whatever comes out of this, into your world? And so, and I think it is a partnership between academia, uh, between industry and the government. And we call it, you know, in advanced level, it becomes a catapult center. In the UK, there are catapult centers. And the catapult center, by the name itself, is just to catapult technologies. It's an incubation place. And so Rolls-Royce created five of those catapult centers with the UK government and with relevant universities and with relevant industry partners. So we have been pushing very hard. I've uh, worked very closely with Niti Aayog, uh, with the governments in uh, India, trying to create such a catapult center where you can bring problem statements from the industry and where you can have academia participate in it to solve the problem. And the harder the problem, you have PhD students doing it. The easier problems, you have the undergraduates doing it. And the complexity of the problem determines what level of education the person needs to have. And then so I think eventually this academia, industry, and government partnership 
is going to be the way of the future. And, and the universities that adopt this and companies that adopt this are going to probably be able to solve their challenges much faster because the world is changing very fast and people in the corporate world are in their little silos. Academia is in its silo. The government is in its silo. So you're going to really need to bring these together. And I think forums like CII, FIKI, uh, initiatives like Skill India, Digital India are all great opportunities where you can bring all this together. And I think we should all probably push the government and push the industry and push the academia to think more in those terms. Because I think that's what the future is going to be. The future is not going to be about rote learning. The future is about learning to find answers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I think uh, you said that, you know, uh, one of the telling uh, comment there that, you know, what used to be an expected life cycle of an existing technology or a business used to be 50 years once upon a time. You said, and now it is probably down to 15 years. It's likely to go down even further. And I think the context is equally true for universities that when you have a pedagogy, which is constantly testing you on uh, what you know by way of a repository of, uh, you said, rote learning or uh, for your ability to dip into your archive of knowledge and pull out an answer to a question is going to get even more and more irrelevant going forward. Uh, because by the time you have passed that exam, that, that technology would have become obsolete. And, uh, and therefore, the only thing that the universities can empower or among, among a few others is, is to challenge the students to, to figure out how to learn to learn. How do you learn to figure out uh, uh, solutions to problems? And often the problems will come as black swans. I mean, of course, I think uh, uh, we should probably call them gray swans going forward post COVID. But, uh, uh, but you know, I, and, and for that, I think, um, you know, this kind of amalgamation mixing, uh, of course, the theory with actual problem solving, uh, Oftentimes, you know, as you said, like, you know, I can, and there are some excellent examples of universities where they are uh, really bringing the workshop inside the classroom and, uh, you know, asking people to really take a car apart and remodel it uh, to learn your mechanical engineering and you invoke the theories as you need it to build, uh, to, to, to make the car work and, and move. So I think... Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm very happy that I think our, our, our lines of thinking are linear on this. So I see that we have already spent about five minutes shy of an hour. And it, be, it would be very um, uh, um, unfortunate if you're not, if you're not going to take some of the questions, they're all streaming in. So uh, there's a question from Parobita, um, who is, it's a conceptual question. I think you touched upon it, but pr probably you can expand this a little bit. What kind of consumer related changes uh, do you think will unfold in the post COVID world? Consumer related changes. Yeah, I think um, the buying patterns will change, right? So, you know, we would, we would be more, uh, because look at it, it, people were spending all their money because they were confident that they will have jobs and that pool of the revenue stream will continue. But when the revenue stream stops, right, then the worry comes in. And the longer the revenue stream stops, the more risk awareness comes inside the individual. So the 60 days, people have been getting their money. Whoever has been working, they've been getting it. But look at what happened to the migrants. They all didn't get the money. They were all struggling for food. So they said, I might as well go back home. And that's why you have this migrant crisis. If they all got their monies, the chances are that they would have probably been a little bit calmer. But I think the combination of the lack of revenue stream kind of played games in their minds and made them even more worried. And that's why you have this whole thing about migrants going back. But similarly, people who have been getting the revenues also think about it and say, what if this goes on for six months? If this whole thing goes for six months, people don't get revenues or not able to work. Companies cannot afford to pay. There's no cash to pay because the companies don't have the revenues. So then if people don't get the money, then what will they do? They'll start. So if they are planning and they're thinking, they will probably say, I need to save right now so that I don't have to have a you know, rainy day without an umbrella. And I think so you will see that people will think before they indulge. The indulgence uh, factor was extremely high pre-COVID. The indulgence factor will be a lot more measured post-COVID. 
and that will mean that they will either buy only things they want or they will buy less quantity of the things they uh, they aspire to have or uh, but also the corollary to that whole thing is they will also look at it and say life is short because you know that all of a sudden there could be a disruption like covid that will put everything to an end or probably eliminate everything that's there in their life and so that is what we need to be looking at and understanding and building on and companies that want to sell have to figure out how to sell based on this new human psychology that is out there super there's another very interesting question from an aspiring bms student that's our bachelor of uh, management studies program kishore so i suspect uh, the young lady would have just finished school or about to finish school high school uh, she says that uh, she seeks your humble guidance Uh, in what kind of leadership skills she should develop at this point in her time uh, to become a successful business woman in the future i think i think uh, you are at uh, you are at your really early uh, phase of life and uh, leadership is as much of um, experience as it is of just getting the knowledge from the books and um, i would say at that stage in life what i find is focus clear focus on what you need want to do clear focus on execution of that which is basically studying and excelling in the knowledge and clear focus on what is it you need to learn right i need to learn is what should be the focus because i need to be a general manager cannot be the focus when you are just entering college but i think i need to learn and i need to graduate with a knowledge that will be par none should be the focus and it should be differentiated when you come out of college there's going to be millions coming out like you so the question is how are you going to be differentiated why is it the companies want to hire you and i think those are the thoughts that need to go in the mind and as you build through those thoughts and you start increasing your focus and focusing on a passion setting yourself that target that you achieve it will give a sense of satisfaction it will allow you to set the next target it will be a reset when you graduate from college join work and i think there you set up different targets and as you go through it as you then you start looking at how do i manage teams how do i get into uh, a leadership position where people will listen to me as you go higher and higher and higher there will be lesser and lesser less of control and you're going to have more and more and more of coaching mentoring uh, delegation so that's a very different world but in the world you are in today it's going to require dedication it's going to require a commitment right consistency comes later but commitment is going to be the key in my view if you do that when you graduate i think you'll have clarity on what you want to do people will know what you've done and they will want you cannot be more clear than that kishore thank you the next question is from professor kaushik choudhury he is uh, uh, he is in the department of human resources uh, and that's about the role of hr in the times of turbulence uh, at the current times in the manufacturing industry and knowledge industries also how do you see the role of employee voice in managing people in organization especially in the context of the current covid outbreak well, look i mean in terms of hr uh, hr is uh, you know lots of times human resources can have a positive or a negative connotation and it depends on the hr individual the hr manager in my view hr is the employee's direct point of contact and a trusted resource that employees can reach out to hr is the trusted resource that leadership teams will reach out to to get help with right so hr is kind of positioned as people resource that connects the leadership with the people on the ground and it's a very 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 important function and for that function to work very well the hr manager has to wear many hats sometimes the hat of a policeman sometimes the hat of a friend sometimes the hat of a mentor sometimes the hat of a coach and be that shoulder that people in leadership as well as people new to the organization can kind of you know uh, reach out 
And uh, uh, there is nothing worse for an organization than a HR manager who doesn't realize that. Because then the connectivity between leadership and employees goes away, right? And I think, uh, in my view, I've been very blessed with having great HR uh, managers. I've also seen some poor HR managers, you know, but in my leadership team, at least, I've had some great HR managers. And uh, I hope that answers that question. In terms of employee voice and uh, the thing, look, we, you know, are my, my communicator, Gayatri, has been working overtime, you know, in terms of uh, sort of communicating with people during this crisis. We have had our risk uh, team, the BCP team, the HSNE team, uh, the communications team, all of them working, making sure that you're connected to people with the HR team and making sure that you understand what is happening with people during this crisis. Our team leaders have been connecting with their teams on a daily basis. And if there are as an engineering center leader with 500 people, he's got a team of about 10 people under him. Those teams have about 10 people under them, and then they have about 10 under them. So it is important at every single level people communicate. So I'll leave with one word. When there is communication, the voices are always heard. And right from my side, I have two calls every week just on just connecting with the leadership teams, understanding it, wherein we all talk about what is happening in the different locations we are in, what is happening that we need to do, you know, what is the crisis, what is the non-crisis, how do we make sure people are motivated, is everybody getting what they need? So it's a constant conversation that needs to happen. And I think listening to the employees is a must because we have to be empathetic, we have to show care, because not only do people have to consider work, which was anyway a full-time eight, 10 hour job. They also are at home. They also have to manage some of the home needs with kids being at home all the time, making sure that they're also learning and they also not feeling frustrated. And in all this, the stress actually is much higher than when people are able to go to work. And I think people are working harder at home than when they used to, when they used to go to work. So bottom line is, it is, it, is a, you know, it is a situation where at the leadership level, a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion is going to be required. And at the individual's level, a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, but keeping one's mental health, keeping one from falling into a trap of feeling desperation, feeling frustration uh, is extremely important. It's extremely important. And for that, I think communication uh, has been a key for us. You know, everything else is about knowledge, but communications is about dissemination of the knowledge. Okay, uh, another question uh, uh, is an interesting one. I, um, it's a market making one. Uh, you talked about Kishore uh, reducing carbon emissions by increasing the efficiency of the machines. Uh, uh, and, um, but but uh, data has it that more than 50% of global warming happens because of animal and dairy farming. Uh, isn't it better uh, to try and change uh, food habits around the world uh, uh, to, than to, uh, you know, uh, by way of a proportionate investment of impact? It's absolutely the right question. And I remember reading an article where uh, I could be wrong on the numbers because uh, it's been a while, but for every, uh, was it a pound or a kilo of beef, there was about 50,000 liters of water required, right? And then there was an unbelievable amount of food that was required to mature the animal to the point where the beef is to the standards of the expectation of people. So all this is definitely affecting the environment in some form or the other because of the consumption of beef. And there's a huge lobby going around this whole thing. And I've seen a WhatsApp message to the same effect uh, as well. So... Look, the world constantly thinks about it, but at the end of the day, you know, the basic needs never go away for humankind. And uh, how these basic needs have evolved over time uh, has been because of the needs. And I think as the needs change, it will also evolve to a different world. And I think it just, it'll take time. These things take generations. We can change from a dal roti to kichdi or something like that a lot easily than somebody who says, I want to switch from non-vegetarian to vegetarian, and so on and so forth. But then if each and every individual, each and every company thinks about this, 
and they are able to sort of say, what can I do? My simple part, a portion of it. I think the world will be a better place for that. And I think, uh, you know, uh, as a company for us, we are thinking about what we do that impacts the world from a sustainability point. And so we feel we have a need to make a difference and we have a need to start doing it now. And so we start doing that. And if every company thought that way, I mean, simple example, if you come to Delhi, I mean, you look at the Yamuna today, it's clean. All it took was two months of all these pollutants being put into the Yamuna. And today it's almost like drinking water, right? It's almost portable. I'm not kidding when I say this because I've seen some videos of the Yamuna River recently and it's just unbelievably, you know, clean. So if we can start small, right? If we can just bring about small legislation that says no effluent discharge into the Yamuna and we are able to manage it, we have to start small. We start boiling the ocean saying that we're going to clean up the Yamuna completely forever. But if we just say that the Yamuna is going to be better than yesterday today and keep working on it, I think it'll be a better place. And I think it takes everybody to think that. And it's, it's going to take time. It never happens um, you know, at the pace we want. It's going to take time. But we are all thinking that way, put it that way. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, you know, maybe um, since with your permission, uh, and then we will have to close given the, that we have already shot overshot for about 10 minutes. Uh, one is an interesting uh, and op op often a dilemma question for a lot of young talented minds. Uh, people go to university, some people go to university to get a job. And some people go to university to become a job creator or get into entrepreneurship. Who, according to you, is the real businessman? Uh, one who is able to invest his mind in the economy or one who is just running as an employee or wanting to be an employee? Well, look, we all, I don't think any of my fingers are the same. So I cannot say that, uh, you know, people like to work. Some people are built to take the risk, like I mentioned before, you know, about step changes and about incremental changes. And I think um, some people are built wherein uh, they, can, they can take risks better than others. Some people are built where they are more caring and compassionate and some people so and more giving. And there are others who are more business minded. And I think we have communities that have evolved around these things. So at the end of the day, each individual is very different. And um, so what works for one does not work for the other. But just like we need all our five fingers, I think we need all of them. And to me, all of them are going to be part of the economy. Right. And the economy is not going to go anywhere if you don't have professors. The economy is not going to go anywhere if you don't have medical community people. So education, medical, healthcare, right? We don't go, we got to have industry, which is comprised of infrastructure, which is comprised of transport. They need defense. It's going to be a vast. And each area, if everybody said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, then there'll be nobody who will serve the needs of uh, the industry. So I think uh, it's extremely important that each individual figures out who they are. What is it that, you know, kind of drives them? What is it they feel happy doing? And if they were to do that, and with all their heart, I think uh, we'll be able to grow. But we need everybody. So there is no, I, I would say, you know, a world without any one of those things that you asked in the question uh, will not be the world anymore. Great. And the final question is, is Rolls-Royce working on biofuel to power the Trent series, just like Etihad did to its B787 using GE engines? Yes, yes. The short answer is yes. And, um, you know, the details of which I'm not very sure of. We work with Airbus very closely. Uh, we are doing it in the UK. We are, uh, you know, also trying to partner with the oil companies. Uh, so there's a lot of a uh, lot of effort going on in terms of biofuel. Because that's the shortest step from fossil fuel into the world of sustainability. And then, uh, like I said, we go into the broader areas of electrification, hybrid to an all electric. Uh, so... Yes, we definitely do work on that. Wonderful. Kishore, it, it was an absolute pleasure getting to know you. And I'm sure, uh, you know, we had, uh, I, last count, I saw more than 75 people on, uh, on, in the room. And uh, we have covered a wide gamut of sub subjects. Um, and you have, you know, um, 
you you had prepared for for uh, talking to us, which we really appreciate, and uh, and your long uh, but uh, expansive coverage in uh, initially really set the stage, and I think we have uh, touched upon um, uh, uh, you know lots of uh, relevant points, and it's incredible to uh, for all of us to come uh, spend you know time with you one on one, but. You know, but, but, but still, uh, I would finish this by saying that uh, uh, we have only had a taste of it. We would uh, continue to pursue you to come, uh, for you to come visit us on campus as and when we are able to get back on campus. Uh, as I was telling uh, earlier that SNU at SNU, we are really pushing the agenda of multidisciplinarity. We, we are really pushing the agenda of uh, learning how to be a learner, uh, learning by doing. Uh, we have set up a data center and uh, a big data analytics uh, center. We are also launching courses in, you know, um, in, in, in uh, arming our students with tools in machine learning, AI, uh, you know, AI, IoT, etc. Uh, so that they, they are not short of tools when they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, exercise their creativity uh, uh, in, in the con constant change process in re-engineering and engineering new businesses or or keeping existing businesses on the relevance curve. And we would uh, love for you to come and uh, visit us, perhaps even share um, if, uh, some sort of a demo or a simulation of what you guys do at the R-Square Lab. That would be fascinating for our faculty and our students uh, uh, to learn from. You talked about the catapult centers in the UK. I believe uh, Shivnather University was also invited by the government of India in some conversation uh, around what uh, you know around the structure and the vision of such centers uh, we don't know what happened to that but uh, uh, I, I am absolutely certain that it would be excellent for our paths to cross uh, as soon as the world gets a bit more uh, normal in its new normal so uh, really wanted to uh, wanted to appreciate uh, on behalf of Shivnada University you are coming here and spending with us uh, your valuable experience and uh, uh, you know, I think um, uh, most importantly, the young people who are here in this forum would have got some very specific answers uh, to a lot of these issues about leadership that you very pertinently said that they are not words, uh, you know, that, uh, that that translation from words to data, which is words to doing, which gets recorded and it becomes data that builds your other C that you mentioned, which is consistency. Uh, I also use another C called credibility uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, um, once this credibility uh, is built with consistent, uh, you know, delivery uh, of promises, uh, the world will seek you out. And I think I'm just sort of rephrasing something that you had said. So uh, thank you very much, Kishore uh, Jairaman. Um, you know, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you and hope to uh, host you in various of our forums going forward at SNU. I will look forward to it. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jairaman and uh, Dr. Banerjee for uh, starting us with uh, so many indicators to watch out for and you know, hopefully capitalize on in the complex scenario today. Uh, this was indeed an illuminating session which uh, deserves to be played back and perhaps slowly for us to really absorb the many you know, visceral messages that uh, deserve deeper pondering and reflection. And, and for that, we will soon have a version of this uh, session available on our YouTube channel. I would also like to thank the audience for their intelligent participation. They had some very powerful and meaningful questions and you know, um, they, they really um, listened to us patiently and thank, thanks for that. Uh, wishing everyone the best of success and optimism for the world of tomorrow. So it's uh, bye for now till the next uh, power pack topic of discussion from the School of Management and Entrepreneurship at SNU. Good day, everyone.